very much for making out the time to be here. Um, I'm trusting God that it shall be a moment when his blessings will be poured upon us and we will be able to uh, find what he has in us, what, what he has for us ultimately. Amen. But before we start off, let's just have a word of prayer together. Righteous Father, we thank you because you are God. We thank you because of the privilege of knowing you. We thank you because of the opportunity that you have granted unto us to be affiliated with you, thereby carrying your name, Christian. Lord, we pray, as we want to unravel your word and then bring to life the meaning of sharing a name with you, Father, we pray you will speak to us indeed, and you will transform our hearts and lives indeed in Jesus' name. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay. What I'm going to be talking about today <clears throat> is a message God gave me very, very many years ago. By God's grace, I met Christ February 2nd, 1990. And it was a unique experience for me because, yes, I grew up in a Christian environment, but then um, I had the Islam side. Uh, my mom was from a Muslim background. Um, and, of course, my dad do Christian, but uh, <laughs> they were the traditionalists back in time. And so we, we had the, do I call it opportunity now, we saw all sides of everything. But then I had a unique encounter with God. I'll try to summarize it. It was a time when I was in a bit of a despair and I was oscillating between Christianity and atheism. And I had made up my mind and concluded there was no God due to some circumstances around me. And on one of those occasions, I went out, you know, we're living in our face my face you house back then. So I went outside. We we had a very big compound. So at the extreme end of the compound, there's this small drainage that goes around the house. So we all go there to pee and, you know, we just move on back into the house. So I went there to pee. And as I was heading back into the house, I had my name. And I'm like, who is calling me? Who is there? And it was very, very pronounced. And it was look up. So I looked up and he said, can you see the stars? And at that point in time, the story of Abraham came to me afresh. And I'm like, am I seeing things or am I imagining things? What's going on here? And it was very pronounced again. He said, look up. He said, what do you see? I said, I see stars. He said, can you see that particular star? And I'm like, yes, there's one very bright star there. He said, I can make you that if only you will follow me. I said, but there's no God. And then I went into my rant. And he said, oh, so you want me to prove myself to you? And I answered, yes. I couldn't see who I was talking to, but I was hearing the voice very clearly. And I said, yes. And he said, okay, and I'll prove myself to you. And the voice left. I went inside. I couldn't tell anybody what just happened to me outside. I went to sleep. So there was a program that was being held in church. Um, back then, it was, you know, cassettes that was being shared in the churches, and there was a crusade. And lo and behold, right there when the pastor was praying over a recorded message on the cassette, miracles were happening everywhere I was. So the moment a miracle happened, I shiver, and then the voice comes back. It says, that is me at work. Then I'll run away from there and run to another place. And where I go to, another thing happens there. So I kept running and the voice kept telling me, that is me at work. At that point in time, I was like, okay, so I give up. I believe there is God. And then uh, the moderator made an altar call and I went out and I gave my life to Christ. And I thought that was the end of it. The voice never left me alone. By God's grace, everything I know in scriptures today, he taught me himself. He would just call me by my name. And I mean, not many people know my F in my name. It's called Fumbi. 
and he would just call me Fumbi, pick up your Bible, and I'll pick up my Bible. Unfortunately, I don't have that Bible here with me. And he would say, open this book. I would open to the book. He would tell me the chapter and the verse. And then he would tell me to read it out. I'll read it out loud. And he would ask me questions. Do you understand? And sometimes I tell him I don't understand. And then he would start explaining. I mean, he became like, I became very used to it. It became an everyday event and occurrence for me when I, I mean, I was this bookworm when I come back from school. If I, before I take off my uniform, I was reading, doing all my homework. I will finish the homework. I will continue into the next, you know, exercise. And I will just go on and on and on. And he then had to, to then come in in between to interject. And then he would tell me, pick up your Bible. Read this chapter, this verse. And he taught me so many things about the doctrines of the Bible. I can remember one day I was going to preach a message. I think it was in a bus. And then he told me, you will talk about Christian. And I'm like, okay, Christian. And he asked that question, who is a Christian? And that was when, at this point in time, I, I had started, of course, doing my own study and a bit of my own research. And then I went into, you know, studying the Bible. And I said, where was the first time the word Christian? was used. And that was how I discovered Acts chapter 11, verse 26. If you do have your Bible, you can open it. If you don't, don't worry, I'll read it to you here. Acts 11, in verse 26. I'm sure it's a very familiar passage. He said, and when he had found him, referring to Saul, who eventually became Paul, he brought him unto Antioch. And this is Barnabas who brought Paul into the church. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. But where I'm going to is the second part of that verse. He says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That was the beginning of that word Christianity as we know it today. They were called Christians first in Antioch. Then I, I, I started questioning and I said, okay, so what was this Christian thing? And then it reminded me of a message I had had where someone was trying to define the interpretation from the Greek and the Aramaic, you know, translation of the scriptures. Um, and he said, the word Christian from the Aramaic, because it was Aramaic language, it was actually little Christ. So like Christ, that that's the direct English translation, little Christ or like Christ. Then I began to ask questions a little more. Why were they called little Christ? Why are they referred to as like Christ? Then my mind took me to the book of Acts chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 3, um, reading the Acts chapter 4, pardon me, in verse 13. Acts chapter 4, in verse 13. And I read it there. He said, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And bear with me. I have several translations of the Bible, but I am hung on King James Version. So for those of you who use other versions, Dalu, Bikun, eh? <laughs> so you'll bear with me with my King James version. They said they were shocked that these guys were unlearned people, people who had no education. But then they marveled at the knowledge that they displayed. I mean, these guys know a lot. And they were like, what could be the reason to it? And then he said, then they took knowledge. Okay. They had been with Jesus. Then I said, hmm. So when you have been with Jesus, it will reflect in your conversation. 
the confidence with which you speak, the mannerism with which you talk, the knowledge which you display, everything comes into Jesus. Then at that point in time, he then asked me a question. Why do you think Christ is different from every other person? And, and he told me actually, begin to list out all the attributes of Christ. So that if you want to mirror a Christian, you can say a Christian should possess all these attributes too. But over and beyond that, what is that attribute that makes Christ very different and unique from everybody else? And at this point in time, we weren't even opening scriptures. It was just, okay, miracles. And he said several other people too performed miracles. Even in the Bible, I mean, we were told when Moses dropped his own rod, he became serpent. All the wise men of Egypt too, the magicians, they replicated it. So performing miracle is no big deal. Anybody, you know, can perform miracles. So that's not a major differentiator. And then I said, the power with which he spoke. And then he reminded me of Paul, even before he became Paul, when he was Saul. He spoke convincingly that even the Pharisees gave him authority to go and arrest all Christians. And we were told, even when they were still contemplating what to do with Jesus Christ in the Sahendrin, the Sahendrin was like the National Assembly of the then, you know, Israel, comprising of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And when they started saying, there came a time, there was a Barabbas who spoke and drew so many men along with him. And eventually, you know, everything ended to nothing. He said, let's we fight God. Let's give this thing to some time. If it is not of God, it will go the way of those people. But if it is of God, trust me, this one will stand. And so, so speaking convincingly, it's not just an attribute that is born by Christians only. Anybody could be an orator. I mean, in fact, we have great orators today in our world who have nothing to do with Christianity, who have even identified with paganism or don't even believe in God. So I said, oh, but he was a pious man. And he told me, I mean, there are several examples of people who are pious all over our world, even in our contemporary times. So at that point in time, I started to start thinking, I had to start thinking about, okay, what other attributes of Christ will I make mention of? And it was at that point in time, he told me to go to the book of John. And I could not miss it. It was in the book of John, chapter 8. And then he said, go and read verse 46. And I said, that's a very contentious area. And I, I, I sat down and I looked at it. I read it and I smiled. And the question there is, which of you convinced me of sin? So I'm like, so if I'm like Christ, I should be able to tell others, which of you convinced me of sin? And then he started by taking me through scriptures. And we started from Abraham. Abraham had been walking with him for about 25 years. He was getting to 100 years when God called him again. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. He said, what was he calling Abraham to? He said, why don't you move on now to Joseph? Look at the life of Joseph. In all of this, Joseph never sinned. How many of us even know that the days of Job was even much earlier in the Old Testament than, you know, just before Psalms when we read it? It happened a lot earlier. It was even closer to the time of Abraham. And he said, Job also came. He said, if he comes around, my, 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 my innocence, I will share before him. He said, even the sins that I do not know of, I am repenting in advance and all of that. And then he took me on to several other heroes of faith. Of course, there were many of them with some of their lapses. And he said, if you really want to be a Christian, I have not called you to become an Elijahite or a Josephite. I have not also called you to become like any of those other people. 
But if you want to say you want to be a Christian, literal Christ, Christ-like, then you need to ask yourself that question. Which of you convinced me of sin? And then it took me to the book of Romans chapter 7. Romans. Uh, we started from chapter 6, actually, you know, and then we went into chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and then we skipped 10, and then we went to chapter 11. Pardon me, this is bringing a lot of memories to me. Um, there was a Bible with which um, I used at that point in time when all of this inspiration and illumination, you know, was coming to me. And like I said, uh, and God being my witness, they were very, very clear to me. Absolutely very clear, spot on. And then he asked me the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the second verse says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer daring? He said, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. And then he went on and on and on. And he talked about water baptism at that point in time. And at that point in time, I sat down. And then I started thinking and I started praying. And I'm like, Jesus, what, what, what do you want me to do here? How do you want me to live here? What, what is the thing that you would of me? You know, what, what are those things that you will want me to do at this particular point in time? And then he took me through the book of John chapter 15. And in John chapter 15, he was praying for his disciples. If you read the entire, you know, book of John 15, and then the entire book of John chapter 16, he was praying for his disciples. And he was talking to them about his exit and what he wanted them to do. And if I read John chapter 16, verse 7, before I, you know, I'll round it up, and then we can just pray together. And, you know, we can call it a day. I know it's been a long day for very many of us too. And I don't intend to take too much time. In verse 7, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. But what is the job of the comforter? The Holy Spirit, whom we all as Christians say we possess, was the very first thing the comforter will do in our life. He says in verse 8, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He said, of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged already. And then he said to me, of all of these attributes, what do you think is the most important to me? That I can live my life as a Christian, as Christ-like, as a man who has done away with sin. And then he said, it is not so much as to our good works. In fact, there was a quote I put on Facebook so many years ago, but people don't understand it. He said, your good works only begin to count after your righteousness counts. And it was something he gave me. I was like, dear Lord, I mean, this is tough. This is hard. How do we live like this? He said, that that's why Christ died. If it was easy, it would not have cost the life of God for our redemption. We could have done some other things for our redemption. But because he knew it was a tough price, and that was why God himself had to die for us. And so, therefore, he summed it all up by saying, you want to be a Christian, the first point is repent of your sins and seek me for grace daily to live above sin. Seek me and trust me every day for the opportunity 
to live above wrong. We can continue to use our flesh as an excuse. He's giving us some discipline. And he's provided us with environment to be able to live for him. But then we can approach the throne of grace also boldly to request for whatever we want. So back to our topic, who is a Christian? A Christian is a man without sin. That's why I said, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. And so are your sins forgiven? Are your sins purged clean? Do you believe in the finished works of Christ? And are you daily living in the realization of that finished work? Is this becoming a part of you? Um, my mind just flashed back to what I was taught. And, you know, the scriptures also confirms this about the point of his crucifixion. He said, if you understood what happened at the cross, and then he took me to the Bible passage where he said, God is of a purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And then I'm like, okay. And then he said, at the point in time when Jesus was crucified, the Bible was presented there with the Bible. You need to unmute, sir. Pastor Victor. You are muted. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So he said there was gross darkness upon the face of the earth. So I'm like, okay, what happened? He said, do you also remember the scripture says the eyes of the father is always on the son, watching over him wherever he goes. I'm trying not to use the King James English, but don't mind me. I'm very used to it when I'm on the pulpit. But then I will try to use our contemporary -ish English here. And then he said, if the eyes of the father is always on the son, is always with him, why then did that darkness occur? He said, because he shut his eyes on the son. And I asked the same question, why? He said, because he's of a purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And at that point in time, the son was carrying the iniquity of the world. I'm like, this is a mystery, Lord. And he said, yes, for you to know the severity of sin. But then, hallelujah, Christ arose. And he took away the burden of sin. And he gave unto us as Christians a vibrant new life that we can live in him. And so if we call ourselves Christians, brethren, it needs to reflect in virtually the life we live. We cannot live the same life that the people we call unbelievers or the people we are trying to convert. We cannot live the same life as they do and then say we are Christians. And like Samuel said just before his death, he said, who among you here can say whose ax have I taken or whose oxen have I taken or whose wife have I taken to myself? He said, my hands are clean. And he was saying it before everybody. And, and pardon me, it became, and, and pardon me for, for sharing this. It became a part of me for every organization when I'm leaving. I call my team and I put up my hands. I say, who amongst you has met me somewhere before? <laughs> who have I called into one hotel room somewhere? <laughs> Who have I collected money from? My hands are clean, though. So you can't say when I do, and then you say, ah, wicked man. <laughs> He's gone. It was just something from there. And, and I think is the biggest thing when we're talking about ourselves saying, who is a Christian? And John 3, 16 says it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. But in chapter, in verse 17, he said something even more instructive. He said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so I don't know what is going through your heart or through your mind. Jesus has no intention or objection of condemning you. All he simply says is, son, give your heart unto me and let me see you 
as a Christian, not the definition of the world, not the definition of people out there, not the dexterity with which you can dissect the scriptures, not the power of the tongues with which you manifest in praying, not even, you know, the miracles that you wrought, you know, by praying for people. I mean, he said it on the last day, Matthew 24. He said, many will come and say, Lord, in thy name, we have done this. We have performed miracles. We've performed wonders. And I will still say unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. So what is that major identification tag that God is looking for? It's not, not so much as to any and everything else. It hinges on that thing. Which of you convinced me of sin? Who among you can accuse me of wrong? And for as long as nobody can look at us and point accusing finger at us and say, oh, you know, you, you are like this. You, you are like that. You too, you also join us when we do this thing. You too, you also commit this sin with us. Oh, people say, oh, um, like we say in church, it is no longer fornication is premarital sex it's a very fanciful name you know premarital just before we get married we have sex it's premarital sex it's no longer lying it's coping it's you know it's um it's uh, garnishing you know and and people give fanciful names to sin to be able to make it more alluring i, I was having a conversation with my wife i said it's in the interest of the devil that all sexually transmitted diseases are curable. And she was looking at me. She said, oh, to, to demand ye. Well, what is this one? I said, yes. Much as we are praying for breakthrough in medical science, he's a doctor and, you know, we discuss all this breakthrough, you know, medicine and all of that. So I said, it's in the interest of the devil that all sexually transmitted infections are curable because it simply encourages the heart of men to commit sin without consequence, forgetting the fact that there is a judgment to come. She just sat down, she looked at me for a while, and then she walked away. <laughs> and then, of course, when we were going to pray that night, I said, Lord, just help us. At the point in time when sin becomes inconsequentially cheap and affordable, you know, that we choose to be able to stay true. You know, I, I was in church the other day, and somebody told me when they are collecting offering in church some people bring their own offering bags from home they go around collect the money and then pretend as if they are going to where they would drop that offering and before you know it they put it back inside their suit and then they go home and i'm like what you long we are stealing money meant for go and you are not afraid ah the kind of knock some people will get even when they get to hellfire that <laughs> god have mercy <laughs> that even of this money said <laughs> i'll be like god I, I can't touch it to how much more god's money you know we need to look at some of those little little temptations in our lives you know the ultimate goal of god is not to judge us it's not to criticize us but actually to help us to know his mind so that we can come unto him with the whole of our hearts with the whole of our mind and we can search him in truth and one last thing he taught me is God does not have favorites. Only people make God their favorite. If you will seek God with the all of your heart, he will reveal himself unto you. And when Moses moved close to God at that mountain and he descended, the Bible recorded that the children of Israel could not even look at him. They had to cover his face with a veil because he was glowing. His face was shining. And I'm like, if we want to dwell in the presence of this all pure God, we have to be pure ourselves. So the question I would ask is this. In the light of some of these things we've talked about, in the light of all the descriptions and the attributes we can give to Jesus that makes us Christ-like, that makes us little Christ, and in the priority and the order that he himself has spelled out, which he eventually emphasized, which of you convinces me of sin? And if you look at various other religions, various, I mean, by God's grace, I've had exposures. In fact, we had the mocks in our house for you to know <laughs> how Jim Jim we were also in all of those things. None other, none other 
promises this life of freedom from sin. They all say we are works in progress. And it makes Christ different. It's not just I go to church. It's not just I believe in Jesus. But it is more on blessed is that man whose sins are forgiven. Because he just gives you peace of mind. And you know that of a truth, when he calls or when he comes calling for me, I will ultimately make it to heaven with him. And therefore, everywhere we go, we just continue to find out that, look, Jesus radiates in our life. He moderates our behavior. He moderates everything we will do. As I wrap up, someone asked me a very contentious question many years ago, many, many years ago. And he said, there are so many variations in Christianity. There are so many traditions that people have brought into Christianity, occasioned by the various denominational affiliations that we all belong to. He said, and it can sound very, very convincing for anyone. I mean, confusing rather for anyone. How do you really know the mind of Christ? I said a little prayer and something dropped in my mind in response to that question. And the only response is this. That thing you are about to do, that thing you are about to, that thing you are about to put on you. Your body. Imagine thing. How does it feel to your subconsciousness? It's like Say you imagine Jesus and his disciples and they just enter Quilox. Pardon me, I'm not judging people, but I'm just trying to stretch our imagination. And they just enter Quilox and they just order three shots of tequila there. Bro, sister, is it thinkable, imaginable that Jesus inside Quilox asking for tequila? Help me mix it with so. If Jesus wouldn't do it, then we probably should not do it too. So if you don't know and you are looking for a guide, just pray every day, read your Bible and ask yourself of that same singular question. Will Jesus say this thing? Will Jesus act this way? And that way, after the prayer of forgive me my sins, I repent in dust and ashes, and I want to de de dedicate and devote my life to you, that irrespective of the circumstance or wherever I find myself, I want to be a true Christian, leaning on your grace to stay away from all lives of wrong and all lives of sin. And then thereafter, we then begin to say, yes, I am following you and I'm living my life exactly the way you want me to. Until we get to that point, I'm afraid we can't say we are Christians. It's, it's, I, I don't care whether you are a worship leader. I don't care whether you are a pulpiteer. You know, the question is, what would Jesus do in this particular situation? You know, I, I, I shared with some of my colleagues, I, I had a direct report who looked at me sometimes. He said, oh, guy, I just like, he said, oh, guy, I'm very good in bed, bro. <laughs> if I handle you was <laughs> I say, you know, uh, what would Jesus do in this situation? Will he follow you or will he refrain himself? I said, I can't. <laughs> it's, it's not because it's something I cannot do, but because I bear the name of Jesus and I have it as a tag on me. I mean, how will I do such a thing and sin against God? God it reminds you of the story of Joseph, the same thing he told to Potiphar's wife. So we need to daily examine our lives and pray for grace and say, God, as I go out this day, you know, he still lead us not into temptation. Please don't lead me to temptation. Any circumstance that we throw temptations my way, please don't lead me to it. And if anything comes my way, he has also said in his scriptures, he will not allow us to be tempted above the measures that we can. So, if that temptation comes your way, it's simply because he's given unto you grace to be able to say, you know what, you can deal with this one, you can handle this one. So, in that light, I don't complain, I don't grumble, I just know that, look, you know what, he's trusted me for this.
And uh, like the story of Job, when we were entering the new year, I said, Lord, please, I don't want you and Satan to make any bet over my life again. This year, <laughs> I just want a soft life. <laughs> I jump on my God, I beg, I beg, I beg. I don't, I don't need those temptations again. <laughs> just give me soft life this year. Make I relax more now, I beg. <laughs> and, and trust me, God answers our secret prayers. He answers everything. And if I go by my relationship with Jesus, um, he's my friend. He's my savior. He's my Lord. I mean, there are times I tell him, Lord, I like that girl. She's pretty. We connect well. The chemistry is just it. Gosh, I tell him everything. But that doesn't mean I'll then go in after the girl. No, I, I'm very free to tell him how I feel. You know, I, I, I said something in church recently. I, I think that was um, either December or something. I said, look, the Bible says that God searches our heart. Okay, whosoever looketh upon a woman and lusteth after her in his heart has committed adultery already with her. I said, do you think Jesus is only interested in the wrong things in our heart so that he can punish us? No, what he's simply saying is he is in our heart and he sees everything. So whether it's a secret fear, a secret prayer, a secret request, he sees it and he takes notice of it and he's working on it. Or it is also a secret desire to sin. He also sees it. So your life is an open book before him. He sees everything. So I'd rather fill my heart with those secret heart requests, with those secret heart desires, with those secret, you know, longing for him than allow my heart to stray in all of those things that do not count. And how then can we maintain this life without sin? Daily Bible reading, daily life of prayer. And the last thing, have an accountability partner. The accountability partner should be someone who shares the same faith and convictions like you are. I mean, I can imagine this lady came to me now and then I go talk to, I know some of those, my colleagues that I can go and talk to them and say, ah, can you imagine this baby is telling me she's good in bed? What's wrong with her? And they'll be like, oh, Mo, what are you waiting for? Go listen there, you know, get this. I know those ones. If I go to meet those ones, they will encourage me to sin. But if I go to meet some other people and I tell them, hey, can you imagine what this girl is telling me? The next thing they will tell me is, where are you going now? You are going home. Okay, call me when you get home. Why? They want to monitor me. I mean, it's me who submitted myself to them. They just want to ensure that I am not giving room to sin because we all get tempted, whether we like it or not. For as long as we are trapped in this body of flesh, we all get tempted. My youths in church, we say, uh, uh, I don't allow them to come to my house. Is it because I live in a mansion or something? I say, my wife is a doctor. She's hardly at home. So I don't want one young 16, 17 year old girl to come to my house and you'll be, eh, I cannot shall I hear anything. <laughs> so, let me be on my own and uh, <laughs> get to heaven with my pillow in Jesus' name. <laughs> then <laughs> for me to now put my hand behind my back and be explaining the unexplainable, it's important we have accountability partners and we set, you know, guides over ourselves. And that way, we can easily fulfill the commandment of God. So I don't know who God may have spoken to their hearts. I don't know who God has opened their eyes. I don't know whose heart is yearning. I don't know who is already craving and saying, Lord, can I have a relationship like this with you such that I can talk to you and I hear you? Can I have this level of devotion that at each point in time, your word jumps at me? and it forms a part of my life and I can hold on to it. And I have this level of relationship with you that I just know that I am in you and you are in me and that the prince of this world can come and he will not find anything in me that he can say, oh, this one belongs to me. I mean, that even unlike Moses, that the Bible said the devil even came trying to contest the body of Moses. And I can say, no body, no spirit, no demon from hell will come and contest over my life because I lived my life transparently holy before you. 
and before men. Let your light so shine before all men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But over and beyond your good works, that even he himself can see that your heart is pure and plain before him. And then ultimately, heaven will be our goal. I am trusting God that with these words, he will keep us, guide us in the places of work, whatever circumstance we face, we'll be able to stand for him. Uh, people may call us Mr. Jesus or Mrs. Mary or whatever name they choose to call us, but we will not be ashamed to bear the name of Christ. Thank you very much. I would like to close with a closing prayer too, before I would hand over to my Oga here, and then we can wrap it up. Um, it's about 13 minutes before one hour. So let me just wrap it up with this closing prayer. If you don't mind, we can pray together. Most righteous Father, we thank you because of the privilege to share your word together. We thank you, Father, because it is never by accident that we encounter a word like this. There's always a purpose for which your word has gone forth. And like your word says, none of your word ever goes forth without performing the purpose for which it was spoken. Father, you have charged us and admonished us at this point in time. Who is a Christian? A Christian is one who is like Christ. And one major thing that typifies the life of Christ, which is faultless, first was his virgin birth, and ultimately living a life devoid of sin here on earth. It's a life of possibility that you have called us all to, and we pray and we ask. We are not ready to give excuses anymore, but Lord, we want to tap into that realm of grace that will make us live our lives holy and pure before you, that people will look at us and marvel, and they will indeed see little Christ in us in Jesus' name. And at the end of time too, when the role is called up yonder, and you are bringing your own people home, Lord, may we not miss it. Owing to one little thing here or there, but we will continue to persevere, walk with you, and live that life as you want us to. Always imagine it. What would Jesus do in this situation? So that at the end of the day, we can come before him and tell the story of how we did overcome on earth, and we'll spend our eternity with him in Jesus name and then every other thing we still want to do this night we pray Lord that your spirit will be with us and mm -hmm. you would ultimately make us that which we should be in Jesus name and if there's any other thing your children are presenting before you like you search the hearts of all men Lord we pray beyond our expectation your word says the spirit maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be altered so we may not do all the praying ourselves, but it's always by your side interceding on our behalf. Let the ministry of the Spirit be fulfilled in every area of our lives, and those pain areas will receive attention before the throne of mercy above in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for having had our prayers. Praise for in God. Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor Victor. Adibayo, God bless you. Thank you for making Thank yourself you, available in spite of your tight schedule. We celebrate you. We pray that God will continue to prosper your ministry and continue Amen. to bless the works of your hands.